Great. Well, welcome everyone and thank you for joining um, for a China is Not Our Enemy webinar. This is co-hosted and organized by Massachusetts Peace Action and Code Pink. Um, I'm Madison Tang with the Code Pink China is Not Our Enemy campaign. And we're really excited today about tensions over Taiwan preventing nuclear war. This webinar with Carl Zha and um, you are welcome to introduce yourself in the chat and where you're calling from if you'd like to. Um, this is also being live streamed on Mass Peace Action's YouTube and will be posted later um, also on Code Pink's YouTube. So it'll be viewable and shareable later. All right, so we will get started. And I just want to give a couple thank yous to um, folks at Mass Peace Action, uh, Cole Harrison, Amar Ahmad, and Raishan Liu, um, who are helping us out to make this event possible. I also want to thank Jody Evans at Code Pink for founding the China's Not Our Enemy campaign. And I want to thank co-sponsors that we have for this event. Thank you so much to Chow Collective, um, please check out their research and their work, Veterans for Peace East Bay and Veterans for Peace, the China Working Group, who have been great um, partners to us in our coalition, working to end and dismantle U.S. aggression towards China and promote peace between the nations. So check out those links in the chat for more from our co-sponsors and more ways to promote peace with China. So I'm just going to go right into it, and I think we will have more opportunity to um, speak more about um, what we're doing with these campaigns to um, mobilize folks in the movement um, to create a peaceful Pacific from the west to the east. Um, we'll be sharing some actions, um, including um, voting, get, asking your senators to vote no on the NDAA, the Pentagon budget, which is record high. Um, there's talks to increase it to 780 billion this year. Um, and as well, we will also have an action that'll be shared related to this topic of Taiwan, um, calling for Representative Elaine Luria in um, Virginia to stop advocating for an expansion of President Biden's war powers over China and Taiwan. Um, she recently wrote an op-ed calling for the Taiwan Invasion Prevention Act, which would expand um, Biden's authority to go to war without congressional approval. Um, so let's get into some of the context around that very issue. Um, I'm very excited to announce um, and introduce Carl Zha, who's a Chinese American independent political analyst, analyst uh, excuse me, and he is the creator and host of the podcast called Silk and Steel about China, the Silk Road, history, culture, and geopolitics. You can find Carl and Silk and Steel podcast on Twitter, YouTube, and Patreon. And we'll be linking to his podcast, Silk and Steel's uh, recent series on the history of Taiwan. It's a very long and comprehensive series. So if you don't feel like we got deep enough into that tonight, it's a, it's a great place to go after this to seek more information so you can find out uh, what your views are after having all the facts in front of you. Um, that series is also with Shang Yu and um, just want to acknowledge that Shang Yu is Taiwanese so uh, you can get into some opinions from uh, someone who has you know deep ties to the region of Taiwan. Um, so thank you so much for being here today, Carl, with Code Pink and Mass Peace Action. And uh, Carl's gonna present for a little bit and then afterwards um, we will go into some further questions. So if you have um, a specific question for Carl, um, I may, we may have time for it. I'm gonna be asking questions first and we'll see if we have time. Um, feel free to ask those though and engage in the chat. Thanks, Carl. Thank you, Madison. And thank you for the organizer of Code Pink for inviting me to speak. Um, I will share my screen now. I, I did prepare a, a slide for this. Um, if every, can everybody see my screen? 
So this yeah. is, uh, <clears throat> I'm gonna first going to present a brief history of Taiwan, just to provide the historical context, uh, hopefully with more nuance than the John Oliver piece. Uh, I have 60 slides, so I will go very quickly. Uh, so first location of Taiwan, Taiwan is located about a mile, uh, 100 mile off the coast of mainland China, southwest of Okinawa, north of the Philippines. Uh, Taiwan has been inhabited since Paleolithic age, and around 5,000 years ago, uh, Australian farmers from mainland China start to arrive. And this is a possible migration route from where foxtail, millet, and rice cultivation happened in first uh, happened in mainland China. These farmers made their way down the coast, and they made it to Taiwan about 5,000 years ago. And from Taiwan, the Australian farmers brought their language and culture and spread it all throughout maritime Southeast Asia, as far as Polynesia, Hawaii, Eastern Island, New Zealand, and as far as Madagascar off the coast of Africa. Taiwanian historical records, uh, during the Three Kingdoms period of China, the Wu Kingdom sent an expedition to a large island called Yizhou. Then early seventh century, the Sui Dynasty sent an expedition to Liuqiu Island. Then in 1292, the Yuan dynasty sent an expedition to Liuqiu Island. So traditional interpretation is that Yizhou, Liuqiu all refer to Taiwan, although there's some disagree and think it re actually refer to Okinawa. But by 9th century, the Han Chinese fishermen start to settle in Penghu Islands in the Taiwan Strait, very close to Taiwan. And then in, 18, in 1281, after the failed Mongol invasion of Japan, the Kublai Khan had his fleet setting up shop and uh, on the Penghu Island and officially set up administration. So from Yuan Dynasty, Penghu Island, this is a location of Penghu Islands. You can see it's very close to Taiwan already. Uh, from Yuan Dynasty, Penghu Islands was officially listed as part of China. Then uh, in 1620s, in the late Ming Dynasty, the Europeans start to show up. The Dutch wanted to forcibly open China for trade. So they, they start by occupying the Penghu archipelago, but the Ming sent a fleet to kick out the Dutch. So the Dutch had to fo was forced to flee to Taiwan and set up shop there. Uh, just another note that start from, uh, from at least from Yuan Dynasty, uh, Han Chinese fishermen start to uh, go across to Taiwan to fish around the waters around Taiwan. The Chinese uh, traders start to trade with indigenous people on Taiwan, and the Han Chinese pirates start setting up their base on the Taiwan island because it's outside the imperial control. When the Dutch came to Taiwan, they set up their uh, fort, fort at Fort Zelandia. And from there, they start to subjugate indigenous people uh, on Taiwan. And the Spanish didn't want to be left behind. So they, they set up their own colony in the northern Taiwan around you know, the present day Taipei area. But after 20 years, the Dutch uh, waged a war against the Spanish, kicked them out. And by that time, by 1640s, Spanish uh, Dutch control almost all the coastal areas of Taiwan. But of course, that left the, the vast interior of Taiwan is still under the indigenous control. This is a painting of the Dutch Fort Zelandia on Taiwan. This is a, a it's it's built on a sandbar called Taiwan, and Taiwan is from a, from the indigenous indigenous name given to the sandbar. But eventually, the name Taiwan will expand to include the whole island. So uh, Taiwan is actually an indigen indigenous name as opposed to Formosa because Formosa was a, was a Portuguese name given to the island in the, 50, uh, in the 16th century. After the Dutch arrived, they set out to expand their colony they, uh, because it was too expensive to bring European colonists to Taiwan. They settled on bringing uh, bring mass uh, migration of Han Chinese migrant farmer into Taiwan. This is an 18th century painting of a sugar plantation on Taiwan. Uh, in fact, the Dutch uh, famously said, Taiwan is a land of milk and honey and the Chinese are the worker bees. And in fact, the, the Dutch exploitation of these Chinese migrant labor was so, so hard, she sparked several rebellions uh, by the Chinese migrants on the island and the Dutch brutally put them down with, with multiple massacres until this man showed up. And this is Koshinga, AKA Zhen Chenggong. He's a son of a, ja a Chinese pirate and, a ja and his Japanese wife. Uh, 
when his dad was still a roving pirate basing off of Japan. But then his dad uh, went back to China, surrendered to the Ming Dynasty, and become a Ming general. So at age of eight, Zhen Tenggong went to China to receive a proper Confucian education. And then the Ming Dynasty collapsed. So in 1640s, the, uh, the Manchus breached the Great Wall and start conquering all of China. Uh, Zhen Tenggong's father, a uh, 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 Ming commander, defected to the Qing government, but Zhen Tenggong decided to remain loyal to the Ming cause. And from his base along the Chinese coast, he uh, launched his resistance against the Qing rule. At, at one point, he even sailed into the Yangtze River and almost took over the city of Nanjing. But eventually he was defeated and he realized he needed a base to uh, a secure base against the Qing. So he's cast his eyes at the Dutch colony of Taiwan where Dutch already brought over tens of thousands of Chinese uh, migrants. And so on, in 1661, Zhen Tenggong brought over 25,000 troops with him and besieged the Dutch in Taiwan. This is after a year of siege, the Dutch surrendered to Koxinga. This is a Dutch painting of their surrender on Taiwan to the Ming loyalist general Koxinga. This is a, a modern Chinese painting of Dutch surrender on Taiwan. Um, after, Kong, after taking over Taiwan, Zhen Tenggong wanted to move over to uh, move to the Philippines and kick the Spanish out of Manila, but he died that year. But before he died, he, he sent the order to execute one of his most capable generals, Silang. So Silang then escaped across the Taiwan Strait and surrendered to the Qing Dynasty. Uh, after Zhen Tenggong died, his son Zhen Jin ruled the island for about 20 years. But after 20 years, the defector general Silang had his revenge. He led, uh, he led the Qing force across the Taiwan Strait and conquered Taiwan for the Qing dynasty. And that happened in 1682. And that's about 100 years before the founding of the United States. This is a paint map of Taiwan in the, in the 19th century. So after the Qing dynasty took over, they expand, the Han settlement uh, expanded on Taiwan. And, uh, as, and they, most, they, mo they took over the fertile plains on the east coast of Taiwan. Um, so, but the, 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 on, the, on the eastern, on the west coast of Taiwan, sorry, the east part of Taiwan, the mountainous part, was still under the uh, under the control of the indigenous people. In fact, um, under the Qing government, the Qing, Qing official pursue a segregationist policy because they don't want the mixing of the different ethnicities to cause ethnic conflict. And then they have to send in the military to put down rebellions. So on mainland China, that means the Han Chinese are forbidden to migrate into Mongolia, to Manchuria, to Southern Xinjiang, where the Uyghur Muslim live. And on Taiwan, the Han Chinese were forbidden to move into the indigenous people's territory. Um, and this, this lasted until the end of Qing rule. There's a famous uh, line called Tu Niu Xian or Tu Niu Line that, that Qing government put in, uh, in place that, that forbids the Han settlers from crossing. And then the Americans would show up in 1850s. Uh, this is a Commodore Perry leading his black ship to open, uh, forcibly open Japan and also the Luchu Kingdom on Okinawa for trade. Uh, this is a Japanese woodblock painting of Perry. Um, and this is a Japanese woodblock painting of uh, Perry's black ship. Uh, Perry actually stopped by Taiwan on his second trip and he realized Taiwan is a strategic importance as a midway transshipment point in the East Asian trade. So Perry uh, sent a, a note to the, he suggested to the United States government that US should annex Taiwan. But his proposal was ignored uh, because US was busy with other things. A few years later, US would be uh, in a very bloody civil war. But after the Civil War, the Americans are back. Uh, so after 1860s, uh, the end of Second Opium War, China was forced to legalize opium trade and threw open all the coastal ports to foreign traders, including the ports on Taiwan. In 1867, American merchant ship Rover sailed from the port of eastern Guangdong, uh, Santo to Yinko in, in, in Manchuria, but on the way it got blown off the course and shipwrecked off the coast of Taiwan. The survivors who made ashore were promptly massacred by the indigenous people for trespassing. And then the American consul at Sham in China, uh, Charles Legendre, went to the Qing government demanding compensation and punishment for all the indigenous people. 
But the Qin official being a being typical bureaucrat said, well, these, these people are savages. They're, they're beyond the pale of civilization. There's nothing I can do. So Americans took that as excuse, excuse to, to take matter into their own hands. They sent in the Marines. Uh, U.S. Marines landed on the island, but they were ambushed and defeated by the indigenous people on Taiwan. So the next point, the American consul in Shaman, Charles Legendre, went back to the Qing government. He went to the Fujian governor, and he threatened that U.S. will take military action against China if nothing was done. So he strung on the Qing governor to give him a battalion of Chinese soldiers. He went to Taiwan. He uh, went to this, this area. This is a, the most southern tip of Taiwan, the pink area that was under indigenous control. And he uh, forced the indigenous chief to sign a treaty to put up a lighthouse and to agree that uh, any Western sailors that come ashore waving a red flag as a sign of distress, um, in indigenous people will pro promise not to massacre them. And to the east of uh, Taiwan is, uh, is a Luchu Island chain or the traditionally Luchu kingdom with capital on Okinawa. This Luchu kingdom has been the tributary state to China since Ming dynasty. But then the Satsuma clan of Japan subjugated Luchu kingdom because Japan was forbidden to trade with China directly. Uh, and by subjugating Luchu kingdom, they found a backdoor way to trade with China. So essentially, uh, Luchu Island become dual vassal of China and Japan for a long time. And, but Japan, after 1860s uh, Meiji Restoration, the Japanese centralized its government, abolished feudal domains, and they wanted to annex Luchu Kingdom outright. And they found their excuse in 1871 when Luchu sailors who were uh, coming back from Okinawa after a trade mission to send the tribute to the Okinawa king, to the Luchu king, on the way back, they were blown off the course and, and, and shipwrecked out in Taiwan at the same place where the American ship Rover shipwrecked several years before. The, Qing, uh, uh, the survivors, again, were massacred by the indigenous people. A few survivors escaped. They ran to the, uh, to the, to the uh, Qing authorities on Taiwan, and the Qing authority fed them, closed them, and sent them back to, to Luchu Islands. And they thought the matter was closed, but Japan didn't think so because Japan uh, demanded that Qin pay compensation on the reason that Lu Luchu Kingdom is now a protectorate under, under Japan. They demand the Qin government pay compensation and also punish the indigenous people who, who did the massacring. Again, the Qin officials said, these are just savages. They're beyond the pale of civilization. Nothing I can do. And then the Qin, uh, then the Japan used as excuse to, to launch its own invasion of Taiwan. This time, Japan was helped by the Americans who participated in the previous invasion of Taiwan. The, the, the um, former American consul to Sham and Charles Legendre became advisor to the Japanese government. He plotted out, plotted and planned the whole Japanese invasion of Taiwan. James Roberts, uh, Robert Watson of U.S. Army, Douglas Castle of U.S. Navy, who participated in the previous U.S. Uh, expedition to Taiwan, became advisor to the Imperial Japanese Army. So this is a Japanese woodblock painting of the Imperial Japanese Army basically massacring the indigenous people on Taiwan. And the Qing government won, obviously didn't want Japanese troops on the island, so they asked the British to, uh, to, to mediate. And in the end, the Qin agreed to pay Japanese compensation and also to compensate Japan for the cost of their expedition. The British ambassador to Japan at the time said, China basically paid pay for the privilege of being invaded. But Japan got what it wanted. Uh, mostly it's a, the implicit recognition by Qin that uh, Luchu Kingdom is indeed uh, under Japan protection. So, so Japan then moved to annex Luchu Kingdom on Okinawa. This is a picture of Japanese Imperial troops posted outside the Royal Palace, uh, 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 the Shurika Castle um, in Okinawa. And, and they, for, they turned the Luchu Kingdom on Okinawa into Okinawa Prefecture. And then in the, in the Sino-French War of 1884 and 1885, the French Navy attacked the Penhu Islands and they also landed troops on Taiwan. And that made the Qing government finally realize the strategic importance of Taiwan. So after the conclusion of Sino-French War in 1885, the Qing officially upgraded Taiwan 
from mere a prefecture of Fujian province to its own province. So Taiwan was made into a province in 1885. Uh, but 10 years later, first Sino-Japanese war happened. This is a woodblock painting of the Japanese Imperial Navy sinking the Qin fleet in the Battle of Yellow Sea. Uh, as a result of China's defeat, Japan forced uh, the Qin government to cede Taiwan to Japan. But that's not what the people on Taiwan want. They don't. They want to be Chinese subject. They don't want to be Japanese subject. So they decided to declare independence. Uh, this they de they declared the Formosa Republic, and this is a flag of the Formosa Republic, the, the tiger flag. Um, and the the Qin governor on Taiwan became the first president of, of Formosa uh, Republic. And this is a newspaper at, uh, illustration published in Taiwan at the time, uh, illustrating the declaration of Formosa Republic. Their calendar year is named Yongqin, which literally means forever Qin in Chinese, uh, which shows their loyalty to, to China. They just didn't want to be Japanese subjects. Uh, so Japan actually had to fight another war of conquest. They landed their army on Taiwan and fought a serious battles against uh, mostly local Hakka militias but their power is overwhelming and they eventually took over Taiwan in 1895. And this is a painting of Japanese Imperial Army marching into the Straits of Taipei in 1895. Thus began the 50 year colonial rule of Japan on the island. Now the Japan didn't just uh, subjugate all the Han settlements to the, on the Western Taiwan. Japan also subjugated the indigenous people in the Eastern mountains. Um, in fact, that this led to a lot of resistance. It, it, most famously in 1930s, the Wusa incident, when uh, the indigenous people rose against the Japanese colonial rule, but they were brutally put down. The Japanese Air Force dropped mustard gas on the indigenous communities. And so eventually by 1930s, all of Taiwan Island had been subjugated by Japan. And Japan started the Japanization program, the so-called Kominka movement. Komin literally means imper subject in Japanese. And to be a Komin, to be a loyal imper subject, you have to give up your Chinese name, you have to adopt a Japanese name, and you have to perform a Shinto ceremony where you give up your, renounce your Chinese ancestor and adopt a fake Japanese ancestor. Now, um, keep in mind, out of the whole population of Taiwan, only 2% of the Taiwan population actually went through the whole process and became a full-fledged Komin. And these 2% are usually uh, match the, the, the landed elite, the, the landlord class on Taiwan who collaborated with the Japanese. Among the Japanese collaborator family is that family of the former Taiwan leader, Li Denghui. His, um, his brother volunteered for the Japanese Imperial Navy and died in the Battle of Manila against Americans. And he himself volunteered for, uh, to be an anti-aircraft gunner uh, for the Imperial Japanese Army on, uh, in Taiwan, because by 1945, American um, Air Force started to bomb Japanese-occupied Taiwan from uh, air base on mainland China. And, and everyone in on Taiwan also are forced to uh, you know, learn Japanese. Um, and this ended in 1945, after the Japanese surrender. This is the day when Japan was restored back to China, according to the Cairo and um, post Dan Declar Declaration. The KMT uh, landed on Taiwan with, uh, with American support. Uh, the problem is that KMT government at this time, it was incredibly corrupt, which actually the civil war will break out soon on mainland China. Uh, when uh, the KMT, when the KMT landed, most a lot of the assets on Taiwan are owned by the Japanese colonial authorities. So the KMT carpetbagger officials came in. They confiscated the Japanese colonial uh, properties, but they turned them into their own personal assets. And because of the civil war breaking out mainland China, KMT increased taxation. Um, the inflation was rampant, and so this created a lot of discontent on the Taiwan Island itself. This all come ahead on February 28th, 1947, when a, Jap when a KMT uh, tax collector beat up a 40 year old woman for selling unlicensed cigarettes. And when the crowd protested, the KMT sh shoot into the crowd and this sparked uh, a general uprising on the um, island against the KMT rule. This, this famous painting was painted by a left-wing artist 
from um, from my hometown of Chongqing on mainland China. And for this painting, he was arrested and executed in 1951 for spreading pro-communist propaganda. And this is a picture of the riot that ensued. Um, uh, there was a general uprising on the island. Then the founder of the Taiwan Communist Party, Xie Xuehong, led the only arm, organized armed resistance against uh, KMT. She actually formed a, a, a guerrilla uh, against, uh, against the KMT. But the KMT shipped troops from mainland, and eventually the uprising was crushed, and Xie Xuehong had to flee to mainland China. This begins the, uh, what's known as a white terror era in Taiwan. So anyone can be accused of being a, a communist sympathizer and be jailed and executed. This is a picture of two women who work at the Taiwan post office. They were, uh, they were accused on the Trump up charges of being communist spy. And one woman, uh, Ding Yao Tao, he, she was already pregnant at the time of her arrest. So her daughter was born and raised in prison. And two years later, both of these women were executed. And this was the environment in Taiwan at the time. And this was all fully supported by the United States, uh, especially after the outbreak of Korean War. This is a picture of US Army officers training and equipping the, the KMT military on Taiwan. Um, and of course, uh, after 1949, KMT was fully defeated on Taiwan, and most and all the KMT troops came. Uh, the KMT was fully defeated on mainland China, and all the KMT troops now pulling to Taiwan with support of the Americans. And U.S. Seventh Fleet, uh, President Truman authorized Seventh Fleet to sail into the Taiwan Strait to prevent the Chinese People's Liberation Army from crossing the Taiwan Strait, from liberating the Taiwan Island. Uh, this is June. 1950. So it's four, it's four months before the Chinese involvement in the Korean War, and this already happened. This is a uh, General Mac uh, 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 MacArthur on Taiwan on August 1950. There's Chiang Kai-shek in the background, the leader of KMT. Uh, oh, here's <laughs> Vice President Richard Nixon presenting a picture of President Eisenhower to, uh, to Chiang Kai-shek on Taiwan in 19... In 1950s, and also during the Korean War, the um, U.S. set up the so-called Air Defense Identification Zones, short ADIZ, for Japan, Korea, and Taiwan. Now, ADIZ has no basis in international law. It's unilaterally declared and includes a lot of the international airspace because uh, uh, each country's sovereign airspace is only limited to 12 nautical miles off its coast. And, but the American declare ADI is on include a lot of international airspace. And look at the ADI is in Korea. It, it stretch it over North, North Korea and almost go up to Pyongyang. And then there's a famous Taiwan ADIA zone. You can see half of it is over mainland China. And uh, the, the, the recent news you hear about Chinese uh, incursion into the Taiwan airspace, this is what they're talking about. They're talking about Chinese aircraft flying over this American declared ADIA zone. Um, and I will talk about that later. And U.S. also placed 12 Matador nuclear capable missile in Taiwan in 1957 and later deployed a nuclear weapon on Taiwan aim at mainland China. And in 1958, during the Kim, uh, Taiwan Strait crisis, when uh, it looks like the uh, China, it looks like PRC was poised to take over these offshore islands that's still controlled by the KMT, uh, U.S. military suggested to use nuclear weapon against mainland China because they, they realize there's no way to stop a conventional takeover of these islands. So they, they recommended uh, using nuclear weapon against the airfields on China. If that, that doesn't stop, uh, that, if that doesn't stop the PRC, they recommended to launch nuclear weapon deep into mainland China. And they also realized, this is revealed in, the, in a recent uh, Daniel Ellsberg leak, um, they also realize there's a possibility that Soviet Union might do a, a retaliation by striking Taiwan and Okinawa with nuclear weapons. But American planners decided that surprise they're willing to take. They're willing to save Taiwan, even if that means that Taiwan gets nuked. They're okay with that. Um, oh, look, it's the President Eisenhower visiting Taiwan with Chiang Kai-shek in 1960. Uh, 
American troop level in Taiwan rose to 30,000 during the Vietnam War. Uh, now, this is an infamous Time Magazine Christmas in Vietnam special uh, on the U US military R&R, aka sex tourism in, in East Asia from the issue of December 22nd, 1967, Future in Taiwan. So uh, during the Japanese colonial rule on Taiwan, uh, the Imperial Japanese Army set up these women attended baths in Taiwan to serve the Japanese. But after the Imperial Japanese Army left, the KMT repurposed this uh, establishment to serve the American GIs. Um, so, you know, it was openly taught in the page of Time magazine. You can find it in the Time Vault. Um, and this is a kind of the state of Taiwan was in. Now, the KMT misrule actually led to the Sparks Independence Movement because KMT precluded unification with mainland China with the help of US, killed off of the communists and leftist opposition. Uh, joining Red China is no longer an option. The opposition to KMT then turned turned toward advocating Taiwan independence because KMT is a Chinese nationalist party that insisted on its rights to rule all of China, including Taiwan. And Ch KMT mismanagement uh, of the interethnic relations. Most people on pre-1945 Taiwan, uh, I'm talking about the most Han Chinese people, originally came from the Fujian province, uh, across the street and they mostly speak Minnan language. The newcomer that came with KMT with a retreat from mainland, they came from all over China and speak different languages. And the KMT depended on the, the military that it brought over from mainland China for control. And by for the fair, but because KMT control uh, every aspect of Taiwan society, and because KMT is a, essentially a mainland, mainlander par party, so mainlanders occupy most of the leadership positions. And KMT also started to force, uh, to impose standard Mandarin language on Taiwan. Now, um, anybody who caught speaking standard Mandarin in, in Taiwan schools were, were beaten. Okay, I, I, I grew up in 1980s China in, in Chongqing. Uh, at the time we are required, we speak standard Mandarin in class, but during the recession, we speak our own, own dialect, nobody bothered us. But in Taiwan, it was different. In Taiwan, this was very, very coerced uh, language program. So this, this all led to the resentment of so-called Bensenden or the Taiwan provincials against the KMT rule. Uh, now, come 1971, uh, United Nations had held a vote. So up to 1971, Chiang Kai-shek regime on Taiwan presented itself as sole legitimate ruler of all of China. But in 1971, uh, majority of the countries in U United Nations voted in the People's Republic of China and voted out Chiang Kai-shek's regime from the United Nations Security Council. And the following year, uh, Nixon visited China. And that's when U.S. issues a jo joint Shanghai communique, which states the United States acknowledged that all Chinese on either side of the Taiwan Strait maintain there's but one China and that Taiwan is a part of China. The United States government does not challenge this position, re reaffirms the interest of the peaceful settlement of Taiwan question by the Chinese themselves. So this is important because uh, back when it was issued, most of the people on Taiwan still identify as Chinese. Right, so it says all Chinese on the either side of Taiwan Strait. Um, in response, as the U.S. normalized its ties with China, U.S. Congress put forth the Taiwan Relation Act because, uh, you know, for a long time, U.S. Congress had this so-called Thai China lobby, which backed the Chiang Kai-shek regime, including the owner of Time Life uh, Media Empire, Henry Luz. Um, so they, the, the, these congressmen put up the Taiwan Relation Act, which uh, <laughs> U.S. is uh, supposed to assess Taiwan, assist Taiwan in maintaining its self-defense capability in effort of deter future of Taiwan by other than uh, peaceful means. Uh, any effort of determining Thai future Taiwan other than peaceful means would be of great concern to the United States. So this this Taiwan Relation Act actually does not oblige U.S. to the defense of Taiwan. It just says. U.S. Uh, should help Taiwan with self-defense. What this actually translated to in reality is every year, I mean, U.S. sell all these outdated, expensive weapons 
to Taiwan. That basically helps to feed the industrial, uh, military industrial complex back home. Uh, then Taiwan enters the Zhang Jingguo era after the uh, death of Chiang Kai-shek in 1975. Now Zhang Jingguo is a, a, a more enlightened dictator compared his, to his dad. He was sent to study in Soviet Union in 1920s, and that's where he met and married his wife. Uh, in fact, when he was studying in Moscow, he met uh, Deng Xiaoping and two became close friends. Um, so Zhang when KMT came to Taiwan, they started land reform, uh, which they couldn't do in mainland China because back, back in mainland China, KMT's support base is a landlord class. But on Taiwan, the KMT support base is the KMT army, and they're not obligated to the Taiwan land owning class. So they actually carry out land reform. And under Jiang Qingguo's rule, Taiwan started to take off economically. And toward the end of his rule in 1987, Jiang Qingguo finally lifted end the martial law, ending the white terror era of Taiwan. So before 1987, it's illegal to form any political party on Taiwan. You know, only, only legal political party is a KMT. Um, so that was ended in 1987, and all the censorship were, were relaxed. Uh, but Jiang Jingguo died the following year in 1988, and that paved way for the Taiwan democratization process. Now, Jiang Jingguo also recognized that uh, there's no hope for KMT to take back mainland China, that in order to stay in Taiwan long term, he need to incorporate uh, the, the locals, the, the, the Taiwan locals into his administration. So he promoted a whole bunch of Taiwan locals into the KMT ranks. And one of them is uh, his successor, um, uh, Li Denghui. And so both Li Denghui and the current Taiwan leader Tsai Ing-wen were the, the Taiwan locals who joined the KMT administration. And uh, under Li Denghui, uh, it, uh, uh, finally, uh, an election was held in 1996. Now, keep in mind, the democratization of Taiwan almost happened simultaneously with the democratization process happening in South Korea, and both being uh, basically US-backed uh, right-wing military dictatorship. Uh, there's a reason for that because in the late 80s, early 90s, that's the ending, winding down of the, the, the Cold War. U.S. can no longer justify supporting right-wing dictatorship. Well, and not that with a straight face. You know, U.S. still do that, but it's, it's increasingly harder to justify. So uh, the democratization process on, on Taiwan and South Korea actually confer an extra level of legitimacy to to the continued support of U.S. to these uh, to these uh, to these 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 governments, and uh, next thing in 1992, the the representative from mainland China and Taiwan actually met in Hong Kong, and this became the basis of what's so-called 92 consensus. So 92 consensus says there is only one China, uh, but from Taiwan side, they 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 take it to mean there's one China, but different interpretations. Whether that China is People's Republic of China or Republic of China, that is open to interpretation. Uh, on the mainland side, their interpretation is there's only one China. And in fact, the Xi Jinping and Ma Yinzhou met in Singapore in 2015, and Xi Jinping has stated publicly, as long as 1992 consensus and its core values are acknowledged, we stand ready to have contact. Um, so, and, and in, even in 19... 15, uh, I mean, 2015, Taiwan leader Ma Yinzhou still affirmed uh, the, nine, the adherence to 1992 consensus, which is there's only one China. Okay, now <laughs> the fun part, the, the, the most recent uh, hype tension in the media about the Chinese aggression. So I took a, a screenshot from the John Oliver video of, of showing the, the PLA aircraft intruding over Taiwan's ADIA zone. So I'm surprised they actually pictured the Taiwan ADIA zone to show you how ridiculous it is. Half of it is over mainland China. And the second fall, they actually mapped out the PLA air aircraft flight path. This is pink line right here. As you can see, it's as far as Taiwan Island itself as possible. I mean, it, it, it's obvious this is still closer to mainland Chinese coast than it's to Taiwan. And the, certainly, the, this area is international airspace. Taiwan has no jurisdiction over this. Uh, you know, at best, what China is doing is uh, what uh, 
what uh, <laughs> is the equivalent of U.S. Uh, freedom of navigation patrol. This would be the Chinese equivalent of the flight of uh, freedom of flight nav of uh, flight <laughs> flight of. Uh, Freedom, <laughs> uh, sorry, too much acronym. Uh, uh, I so I actually saw um, I followed the, the the Twitter of the Taiwan Defense Ministry. They actually tweeted out, you know, on daily basis of of fly paths of PLA aircraft. So this happened on November seventeenth. So so either yesterday or a couple of days ago, depending on your time zone. And you can see this is the actual fly path of the PLA aircraft. This little red arrow right here. It's so far from Taiwan. I mean, so why? Um, and Xi Jinping uh, gave a speech uh, recently during the um, hundred year anniversary of 1911 uh, the Chinese Revolution. He actually said, OK, so I took I went to YouTube and I took the Guardian uh i went to the guardian channel to take the guardian translation because you guys are not going to believe me if i take the chinese state media version so according to the guardian translation of the xi jinping speech uh you can still find it on youtube just type xi jinping uh, taiwan speech uh and this xi jinping said this Re reunification through a peaceful manner is the most in line with the overall interest of the Chinese nation, including Taiwan compatriots. And of course, this got spin in the Western media to oh, Xi Jinping reiterate the pledge to swallow up Taiwan. So why hype up the tensions? Well, uh, for on the side of Taiwan, for the Taiwan politicians, the fear mongering actually win votes. Uh, the current Taiwan leader Tsai Ing-wen's approval rating was in the single digits before the, her last re-election. The fear mongering about the PRC during the Hong Kong protest actually helped her to win the election. So any hyping the, the cross the straight tensions will help her party to win elections. Um, this, uh, this is, uh, if, if anybody still pretend Taiwan is not appendage of the US empire, here's uh, Tsai Ing-wen's congratulation uh, tweet to uh, Donald Trump on his uh, <laughs> presidency. Democracy is what ties Taiwan and US together. Look forward to advance our friendship and partnership. Congratulations, Donald Trump. And then uh, in, in 2020, uh, during the, 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 our latest election, there was a pa widespread panic in Taiwan because a lot of the people, a lot of these uh, <laughs> separatists, they were so pro-Trump. They, they went all in on Trump. There was a panic among the pro-Trump citizens when Trump lost election on Taiwan. This is an article from Newsweek on November. Uh, on Taiwan president urged calm as pro-Trump citizen panic amid Biden vote surges. So yeah, OK. Um, now, why, why the reason for US to hype up tension? The US national security establishment, um, US, US China tension is used for justify near trillion dollar defense budget. I know we're not exactly trillion dollars yet, but it's their goal to get there. Uh, you know, we get this ridiculous headline like the Coast Guard is vital to defend Taiwan against China. They're not talking about Taiwan Coast Guard. They're talking about U.S. Coast Guard. OK, so the, the griff is so ridiculous that that's so transparent. And again, you know, U.S. spent 13 billion dollars to, to build the USS Ford aircraft carrier and U.S. is planned. Sorry, I use my own tweet. <laughs> it's, and uh, US is planning to build 10 of these, right? And, and you know, w what healthcare? <laughs> they don't care about healthcare. Okay, so this, I, I, this, this wraps up my, my talk. I tried to make it brief to leave question, time for a question maybe from Madison so we can uh, make it more uh, interactive. Uh, and thank you for giving, allowing me time for do this presentation. Thank you so much, Carl. Um, thank you so much for those slides, uh, images and maps, and for that rapid pace, uh, comprehensive summary of um, history and the, the layers of colonization um, in Taiwan, which um, is really tragic and should not be um, taken lightly, uh, especially the Japanese colonial era, which was very violent and brutal. Um, that was super helpful breakdown. So um, 
Let's see. And I see we have some lively discussion in the chat. Thank you all for offering your opinions. So I wanted to follow up with a couple things. Um, you talk about, uh, let's see. So you, you mentioned John Oliver. And so for folks who aren't aware, there's a, a recent segment that John Oliver decided to do on Taiwan, on the issue of Taiwan and status um, and uh, recognition of Taiwan as a nation or not, um, which he acknowledges that the UN and the WHO uh, don't generally uh, acknowledge Taiwan as a nation, even in the segment. Um, but it was a big uh, deal that he addressed it. Um, and so kind of following everything you talked about, why do you think there is this sudden intense fixation on Taiwan, um, especially from the West, especially from the US State Department and mainstream media um, right now? Um, and what does John Oliver leave out of his popular piece? Uh, you mentioned how there is a bit of uh, lack, lacking nuance, um, and he actually uses up so much more time and speaks even slower than you, but he still manages to leave out some nuance. So, yeah. Um, so I, 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 I actually did a reaction video to the John Oliver segment with uh, Taiwanese communist rapper Xiang Yu. Uh, he, he, Xiang Yu actually dug out the people who actually did the research for John Oliver's piece. And, and they're like your, uh, your, your, your think tankers, your, um, uh, one of them, uh, Jessica Zhuang is works for the Project 2049, which is a American US neocon think tank. Um, uh, one of them, James, uh, James Lee, I think he is, uh, he is on, literally on the payroll on, of the Taiwan government. And, and so this is like who I mean, and 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 the whole bunch of NED adjacent organizations. Um, so the, the the this is these are the source of John Oliver piece. But to address your question, why the recent tension? I, I think um, there's still a lot of uh, one thing that he failed address is uh, to present it as a Chinese aggression uh, uh, toward Taiwan, but uh, distract from the bigger picture. Uh, I already talked about his uh, his presentation of the massive Chinese uh, flight over the Taiwan ADIA zone. What get failed gets to mention is that that was a response to the Chinese uh, to the U.S. Seventh Fleet uh, with a uh, with a combined fleet with of Japan, Australia, UK. Uh, they sailed a huge armada through uh, Bashi Channel between Taiwan and Philippines and inter into South China Sea to perform a uh, military exercise in South China Sea. That's what China was responding to. It wasn't even a message to Taiwan. It was a message to United States because I think the Chinese leader understand correctly that the, the cross the, 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 uh, the, the cross strait relation is really uh, uh, is really a between US is really a, a, a matter of US China relations and and at this at this point, you know, people say, oh, you know, what about Taiwan? You know, unfortunately, you know, right now, Taiwan don't have too much to say because, you know, you, you, all we hear is uh, is the side we hear from the from the from the U.S. State Department <laughs> or the, the press release from the Pentagon. And, and for them, it's useful to present uh, this as U.S. is defending the freedom of Taiwan people from the from the Chinese communist, uh, like, like they have been saying since 1950s. And, but, but what, you know, we, we, we all know US don't really care about human rights of people uh, in other, other countries. We, we, what we do know is that um, US finds this as a wedge point uh, to increase the US-China tensions, to continually funneling increasing funds into the US, um, uh, industrial military industrial complex. You know, U.S. Navy wants to have a 355 warship Navy. You know, I think right now they're up to 300. They, they still want to build 55 more warships. The, these are the th things that for them to to justify the budget increase. You know, so this is why we cannot have health care or, or, or better infrastructure in this country, because we need to spend all these gazillions of dollars to, quote unquote, defending Taiwan. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, and in terms of uh, 
I mean, the U.S.'s history as a military power and an imperial power, we know there's extensive genocide, uh, but even currently, uh, as you spoke a bit about uh, the Ryukyu Kingdom and um, Okinawa, so currently our tax dollars are being spent building a dangerous base in Hinoko Bay in Okinawa. So uh, we are also putting the Israeli Defense Dome in Guam right now and uh, raising carbon sequestering forests in places like Guam and the Northern Mariana. So and people in Okinawa, Island, they don't uh, and impacted. people in Okinawa don't want American military there. They have made it clear in the last. Uh, 50 years that the, the majority of people on Okinawa want the US military out, you know, so all all these pretensions, we are there to protect our Asian allies, because our Asian allies, allies uh, want us there. This is a lie, you know, Okinawan people don't want US military on the island. Now, some people say, oh, but Japan want the US there. Well, that's because Japan kind of treat the people of Okinawa as a second class citizens. And they, they didn't want the US military base on their Japanese main island. So they stick the US Marine base on Okinawa. Um, and, and as I mentioned a little bit about the history of Okinawa it used to be its own independent kingdom. And it has never been treated by, by a government of Japan as an equal part of their territory. Uh, so yeah. Right, and uh, we have Colonel Ann Wright was here. She's um, one of our partners and volunteers, and um, she also mentioned Jeju Island um, and um, similar history of anti-communist uh, exterminations and such. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, and also the framing of China as uniquely aggressive or more aggressive than the US when the US is across the world with warships doing joint exercises daily and, and if you want like simple evidence of this as a US citizen, go ahead and check on the websites or the social media of any of our Indo-Pacific Command, our, our Navy, our Air Force, our military, our Marines. And they're just bragging about these joint force exercises they're doing, including with in, past Imperial nations like Japan, um, the UK, Canada, um, and using the hashtags like lethality and joint force lethality. So th this is happening and the aggression is being led by the U.S. Um, yeah, I asked, I asked my friends who live in Taiwan, they said, oh, you know, everything is normal. Life is, you know, life goes on, you know. Uh, whereas in U.S., when all our information comes from these propaganda me mainstream media channel, everybody thinks China is launching imminent invasion of Taiwan. That is not happening, okay. For those of you who want to see that, I'm sorry. You know, <laughs> liberation of Taiwan is not going to happen anytime soon. There's no pending Chinese invasion of Taiwan. That, that, that's, that's just not in the cards. Like any, for just for, for pure practical reason, for any kind of operation to take place, there will be a huge mass of troops on the on the Chinese coast that could easily be spotted on by the satellites. So 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 there's no pending invasion of Taiwan. Let me let me just be clear about that. And and right now, you know, there's, there's a U.S. has an interest to hype up these maneuvers as as uh, you know a super aggressive Chinese move to again to feed the in, military industrial grift at home. And the fixation in the media and government here in the U.S. in the West, uh, it also aligns with uh, the U.S. Uh, military leaving Afghanistan and having less of a foothold on that border of China to, quote, contain China. So the timeliness of this fixation is also uh, important to consider. Um, is there any peace movement on the ground that you know of in Taiwan? Um, is there any domestic dissent or opposition to Taiwan's mass spending on U.S. weapons. Um, recently, there was a $750 million arms sale that we uplifted, um, educated on, and tried to oppose at Code Pink, um, howitzers, and, and pretty sophisticated uh, equipment, actually, that goes in opposition to the three communiques uh, agreement to not sell sophisticated weapons. Um, also just generally Taiwan's increasing reliance on US military involvement and US troops uh, being on Taiwanese soil. Um, I don't think there is currently any organized movement, but um, I, for people who understand Chinese, I highly recommend you go on YouTube and, and Google these uh, street interviews that they conducted on, on streets of Taipei. So, so Taiwan people, uh, people are asked about their views on the, 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 the usefulness of this US weaponry. And almost 
all of them says these weapons are useless. <laughs> but uh, the, you know, all agree this is some a price they have to pay for some sort of American help. So so it's it's essentially protection money. Everybody understand these these high high budget um, high price items are outdated it's actually not it's not actually useful it's just something they have to keep feeding the u.s military industrial complex to keep us happy so so they take taiwan side so that's that's uh, kind of the over uh, veiling public opinions on the street yeah the disclosure that uh troops have been in taiwan u.s troops for over a year uh some some people have been assuming that for a while, but the public disclosure um, was not a uh, not welcomed by Beijing, definitely. And um, in many ways, the US military causes uh, devastation and violence for anyone um, on bases that are overseas, like economic deprivation, violence from accidents, uh, contamination like PFAS chemicals, uh, military crimes, et cetera. Um, the I also want to bring up, you talked about indigeneity in Taiwan, and, and we hear a lot of misconceptions, misinterpretations, we hear different narratives. Uh, it can be pretty confusing for uh, just the average Western citizen trying to um, support the right thing. Um, um, can you speak to how these misconceptions or misunderstandings become entrenched, where that begins, um, particularly in the present day? And are there any parallels to uh, how revisionist history gets taught elsewhere, like in the U.S.? The, the main backers of Taiwan separatist movement are not the Taiwan indigenous people. Let me put it that, that out there. They are the, the, the Han Chinese on Taiwan, which now consists of almost 98% of the Taiwan population. Uh, the 2% of the indigenous people on Taiwan has been, uh, has traditionally been marginalized. And, uh, you know, that, that, has, that has been the case. And there's no, uh, when they say, when you hear media talking about native Taiwanese depending independence, they're not talking about indigenous Taiwan people in, uh, demanding their island back. They're talking about the the you know the Han Chinese people on Taiwan who came to Taiwan who, whose ancestor came to Taiwan before 1945 that that's so so there is a difference there um, and it, it's it's uh, so yeah the, 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 in fact uh, among I didn't want to go too much into detail about Taiwan domestic politics um, because you know I, I don't know how much of the interest is to the American audience, but I did cover that extensively with my uh, talk with Xiang Yu on our on my podcast, the Taiwan History Series. Uh, so right now, Taiwan has two parties, just like U.S. like two party system. Taiwan has uh, DPP and the KMT. The, the, the KMT still nominally pay lip service to like one China principle. Um, and whereas DPP is normally seen as a pro-independence party. Now, the, the, the indigenous people on Taiwan vote overwhelmingly for KMT. And, and why? Um, I think uh, one, 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 um, one, one person told uh, Xiang Yu uh, that you know, at least the KMT has a decency to buy votes from us. The DPP does nothing for us. I mean, it's very, uh, it's a very practical way approach. But so, so that that that's that's a uh, you know that's people need to realize when they when the American media saying native Taiwanese de demanding independence, they're not talking about the indigenous Austro nation people who have been living on the islands for thousands of years. Thank you. Um, let's see. Uh, we have a question from uh, Cole at Mass Peace Action, and I'll add a little to it. He's wondering what is the uh, the United States right now has the Innovation and Competition Act. Uh, it's a bill in the Senate. They recently were trying to push it through in the uh, Defense NDAA um, Pentagon budget. Um, right now, they're really trying to push it through. Pelosi's trying to take it to conference without having a bill in the House. Uh, its companion bill was supposed to be the Eagle Act, which we've been opposing at Mass Peace Action and Code Pink, um, and it hasn't been put to a vote. So in some sense, somebody is hearing some opposition, um, whether within the House or from the public. Uh, but the bill has to do uh, with many things. It's huge. But one thing I want to point out to specify, uh, 
It has military funding for the Asia Pacific. It uh, has provisions for more joint force exercises with the US uh, allies like the Quad. Um, it has anti-China propaganda, mass funding, um, like 500 million for Radio Free Asia, um, outlets like that, the US Global Agency for Media, it has McCarthyist provisions um, about surveilling Chinese students and researchers. And then it has a lot of funding for science and research, including uh, microchips. So there's the Taiwan connection. Can you talk a little about that? Uh, yeah, let me talk about the, uh, the, the semiconductors. So, 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 you know, even John Oliver talked about semiconductors. So, uh, you know, Taiwan manufacture most of the world's semiconductor. And during the Trump, Donald Trump administration, Trump forbid Taiwan to export semiconductors to mainland Chinese companies such as Huawei. And, and because of this, uh, because this is, this is, so now they're posing this as China might invade Taiwan because they need semiconductors. Well, they need semiconductors because Trump forbid Taiwan from selling semiconductors to mainland China. And, and now there's a shortage of semiconductor worldwide. Why? Because Trump also, uh, US also placed sanction on uh, on semiconductor manufacturers on mainland China. So, so any company that has any uh, US business are forbidden to purchase semiconductor from mainland China. So that means GM, a US company, a GM in China making cars for the Chinese market, they are not allowed to you purchase chips from the chi indigenous Chinese <laughs> semiconductor manufacturer to put in cars as they sell in China. So this is a this is in a way kind of artificially created semiconductor shortage by the U.S. policy. U.S. policy certainly made it a lot lot worse. And and um, U.S. also demanded that the Taiwan semiconductors will hand over their trade secret to the U.S. There was a they demanded a technology transfer. And the Taiwan Semiconductor uh, uh, comply, you know, and and this is, you know, to say that, you know, you know, how can you, that? This is a kind of the fate of a, being a U.S. colony. You don't have sovereignty. You know, if U.S. wants something from you, you have to you have to submit. Whether that means you have to pay for expensive, useless high tech weapons, or it means you have to hand over trade secrets. Thank you. Um, yeah, that's a side of things that there's so many elements to the US uh, and Western hybrid war on China. The science and tech side is one element and that's how the Biden administration and Congress are, are also justifying domestic spending, um, which in some ways is good. We, we, we do want some domestic spending for infrastructure and research, but it's being justified just like uh, military spending by this inflated threat of China. Everything has to be done in opposition to uh, the falsely inflated, falsely constructed expansionist China, which is it that doesn't actually have these kinds of intentions that are yeah. placed on today. Yeah. I included the in my slides, uh, the meetings between the mainland and, and Taiwan representatives for talks is because there has always been talks between the two sides. Um, and, the, the, you know, the, there's a there's a, a ongoing conversation, but US is inserting itself into this conversation between between the, 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 the two sides of the Taiwan Strait. And, and you know, why is a US business? Uh, like I just saw a tweet, a ridiculous article today. Someone say, oh, Taiwan is not ready to defend itself. You know, we're so frustrated why Taiwan is not spending more money on its military. Why they're not, uh, the, why they're not, it's so frustrating for US that Taiwan is not ready to defend itself. It's like, it's none of U.S. business. I mean, like, is it? Are you really proposing we're going to have to defend Taiwan to the to the last Americans, to the last drop of Americans? I mean, that's a, just a ridiculous, ridiculous proposition. I mean, there's so many things we can focus here at home. We can we can focus on developing U.S. We can we can fo focus on on fixing the broken infrastructure. We can fixing on on the you know providing universal health care, but right now there's no money for it because all the money goes on to feed our military and and we have to make up all kind of bogus reasons like this taiwan threat definitely what the pentagon budget is so overblown and is just draining resources from um 
life affirming services that could be going to US citizens. Um, instead, we're just uh, hell bent on maintaining a, a war economy in terms of our government and the Biden administration and the military industrial complex. Um, I want to ask also, uh, let's see. You, uh, this is a question from Charles Shu um, of Chow Collective. Um, Chow Collective is one of our co-sponsors for this webinar. Um, he says, I'm also curious how the Japanese colonial era is remembered in Taiwan among Hakko versus indigenous people and whether that tracks with attitudes regarding independence. Oh, brother. Okay. So the, the sh I think the short answer is the KMT has mismanaged Taiwan so much that made the people in Taiwan feeling nostalgia for the for the Japanese colonial era. So the one of the reason is because Japanese colonial rule has become so a uh, distant memory by now, whereas the, the, the KMT misrule is fairly recent, right? After 1945. Uh, and so people kind of pose this kind of false dichotomy between, oh, at least life were better than KMT in the in the in the Japanese colonial era, which which is kind of selective reading of history. But uh, this is kind of the contradiction on the island itself. Yes, yes, definitely. It definitely tracks the the kind of pro separatist, pro independence sentiment on Taiwan. Um, and and what happened, you know, after the Taiwan's democratization process uh, is that. You know the decade of anti-communist propaganda on Taiwan Island itself combined that the kind of the dis 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 distaste for the KMT rule because KMT were seen as oh these are the outsiders that come from mainland China these are mainlanders combined with that the, the anti-communist propaganda about mainland China and 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 that kind of foster a kind of very distorted view of mainland China. Uh, among, I think, many Taiwan youth, uh, it, it, it's it's unfortunate, and that that's what it is. It is what it is. Yeah, there's a lot of unfortunate uh, trauma and internal divisions that come with that kind of uh, the layers of colonization. It, it but is I also like to that. point out, uh, you know, you know, since lifting of uh, so 1987 is when Taiwan finally lifted restriction on on people going visit family on mainland and uh, for and in 19 in 2000 is when they agreed to direct communication between taiwan and china before 2000 you to fly to for a taiwan businessman to go to china to go to shanghai they have to first fly to hong kong and then from hong kong fly to shanghai because there's no direct flights so after 2000 the restriction finally lifted on the taiwan side so now they can go back and forth and and now there, there's an estimate somewhere between 1.5 million to 2 million Taiwan people living, studying, working on mainland China. So, so there, there are uh, cross communication, uh, cross trade communication at the grassroots level happening as we speak. Yeah, and it reminds me of, um, you know, the Korean Peninsula and the forced separation of families there from the border created by US interference, um, the war that is still ongoing that we're calling generally for at Code Pink, um, and I think also at Mass Peace Action for uh, an end to that US war and intervention. Um, and yeah, even my own grandfather, he's 92, he, he, he recalls uh, how there were indigenous people in Taiwan prior to, um, prior to the KMT, KMT, prior to Japanese colonization, prior to everything, um, and the, the divisions created by US interventionism, he, he has compared it to South Vietnam and South Korea as well. Um, yeah. uh, let's see, I think we'll just do one more question. Um, I know we're over the hour, but I wanted to leave some room for uh, audience questions. Um, so thank you so much for being here, Carl. Um, my last question is um, just uh, opening it up to what possibilities do you see um, for regional stability, um, mutual cooperation, and what Globally, we refer in, in the international community and such as maintaining the status quo, um, including strategic ambiguity that's that's kept peace in the region between the US and China and the island of Taiwan, um, and including nuclear disarmament, because we know that the US uh, is the, one of the only powers uh, 
to have threatened, well, it's the only power to have dropped an atomic bomb um, on Japan and, and it almost uh, had a nuclear airstrike on China during the Taiwan Strait crisis. So what possibilities do you see for uh, maintaining a mutual trust and cooperation? Yeah, US only pulled out its nuclear weapon out of Taiwan in 1974. And right now, uh, I think I, I, it's my hope, more a kind of wish that uh, China Taiwan relation can maybe at least go back to like 2010s level when when things are are less heated. And and keep in mind that uh, from the from the PRC side, it has the PRC rhetoric is, has been pretty consistent over the years. Uh, they want peaceful re re reunification. Uh, so I don't think there's any kind pending invasion of Taiwan by the PLA anytime soon. I, I think uh, the mainland China is fine with the status quo uh, unless they move, uh, you know, separatists on the island to move to de declare formal independence. And I, I don't think the, the government on Taiwan will do that easier because the DPP has been in power several times on Taiwan. They never move toward uh, actually, actually go ahead and declare independence as is their party platform because they correctly understand um, just as like Chinese US military understand that while it's, it, it's uh, useful to manufacturing tension, you know, for their own political gain, but it's not, it, it's no fun when if actually everything, the, the, the false of cards falling down. So uh, it, it, that, that's why uh, Tsai Ing-wen, the current leader said, oh, we don't need to declare independence because we're already independent. So, so she is kind of back, back pedaling uh, in that regard. So I, I don't think there will be, um, there will be a war in Taiwan, um, uh, but I do wish uh, uh, for increase economic uh, uh, engagement, at least economic engagement, I think everybody can agree on because right now, uh, I think 40% 40 uh, 40 of the Taiwan economy is is depending on on, uh, on, on trade with with, uh, with the mainland China. So so the, the, the two sides are very already economically very much integrated. Um, but you know, you just need to get U.S. out of the picture. You know, the the, the U.S. ban on the semiconductor export from Taiwan to mainland—that's totally ridiculous. It's like, why does U.S. get to dictate what does Taiwanese company do to sell to customers on mainland? That's that's crazy. But but you know, that's what U.S. do because U.S. is is a world hege hegemon. I think there will be a lot more room for uh for cooperation between the two sides if the u.s stopped encouraging uh certain elements on taiwan for encourage for you know stirring up tensions because it, it, let's face it taiwan is still very much a client state of united states i mean government on taiwan won't do anything without explicit approval and backing of united states government so again so it goes back to 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 us so i i see some encouraging signs because the recent uh xi biden summit uh, where uh, Biden again reiterate uh, the, the U.S. will abide by the Ch one China policy and, and U.S. will not support Taiwan independence. I see that that as a positive sign because uh, Biden has said that, uh, you know, let's not let's make sure our competition uh, not veer into conflict. It's actually interesting to contrast the, the speech, the opening speech given by Xi and Biden, because she actually said, you know, the both American and Chinese people want us to work together in friendship and cooperation. What Biden actually said was, uh, we need to make sure the comp our competition does not veer into conflict, just, just straight and fair competition. So he's still stressing the competition part. And I think Biden is speaking to his domestic audience. You know, he doesn't want people to label him as a panda hugger or Beijing Biden. And, <laughs> and at the same time, he did recognize we need to cool off the tensions. We need to cool off the rhetoric so it doesn't actually go into a hot war, uh, which benefits nobody. And, and, and but, but again, I don't think the U.S. Uh, deep state is going to give up on the, on the competition aspect because that's what will continue to provide the trillion dollar grip for the military, for the intelligence services, you know, for all the, for the, all the arms manufacturers. So, so I, I, yeah, it's, it's, it's unfortunate, but I think for the left wing 
people, for the people leaning on the left on the US, we should focus on what we can focus is on is anti imperialism. We can, we, we should be, an, you know, anti interventionism. US has no business to, to interfere in the, in the affairs of other countries. Nobody elected us to do it. Nobody elected Biden to, you know, nobody on mainland China or nobody on Taiwan elected Biden, uh, right? I mean, so what does US have the right to speak for, for the uh, people outside of its borders? And, and there's plenty of problems in US and we need our energy to focus on, you know, building a better, more justable, justice society here at home. And I think that's a, like a baseline we can all, all agree on and then build the common alliance. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's great. And totally agree about economic cooperation. And uh, I think it's Arto in the chat has also mentioned the influence of also right wing Taiwanese backed media in the US. So this relationship kind of going both ways, the idea of like neocolonial collaboration and such. Um, um, and I think it's also worth uh, reemphasizing that US weapons and services and troops won't actually protect Taiwan. Um, won't actually save and pre preserve the safety of Taiwan in the case of war. U.S. military interventions also don't ever make uh, human rights uh, improve, in, especially not human rights or infrastructure or the environment um, during this climate catastrophe. It never improves any of those things, while U.S. citizens at home suffer from a lack of uh, services and resources. Um, Thanks again, Carl, and thanks to Mass Peace Action and our co-sponsors. Um, please check out Carl's uh, extensive podcast, um, which is on YouTube, on the history of Taiwan. Um, and please follow Mass Peace Action and the Code Pink China is Not Our Enemy campaign as we build the movement to counter and dismantle US aggression um, and the US hybrid war on China to promote a future for people, peace, uh, the planet, and for everyone in the future. Yeah. Thank you so much. Everyone Thank you, Madison. Care. Thank you for the organizers of Coping for inviting me to speak. I felt honored. Thank you very Thanks, much. Thanks, Carl, for putting uh, our background on right before and from calling all the way from Bali, Indonesia, um, early in the morning for him. <laughs> <laughs>